Uh, we'll turn it over to Mr. Jason Coleman, uh, the general manager at the High Plains Water District, who will discuss their demonstration study of the Dockham Aquifer. And Jason, I will turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. How is the audio, Zach? Sounds perfect, sir. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and thank the others who have led into this discussion today. We have a, uh, a, a number of different perspectives on these issues, and they're all valuable. And I appreciate the, you and the others for uh, moderating these discussions and taking some uh, interest in them. And I want to share some of the information from the High Plains Water District today in this discussion, which you might say is probably more of a, a groundwater management discussion more so than, than brackish uh, groundwater in particular. But with that said, I want to uh, give you a, a quick quote here and this quote is uh, from Cadillac Desert. If, if you've ever read this, you'll be somewhat familiar with the, the content, but uh, it is of great interest in, in water resource uh, history and in management. And this uh, particular quote has the uh, City of Los Angeles uh, Water uh, Department, and uh, they, they had a report uh, issued in, I believe it was 1904, that said, we're gonna have to find uh, an alternate supply. And so, like today, uh, not much has changed. Uh, if you're involved in water resource management, supplementing the supply from another source uh, is not just a play on alliteration, but is uh, still an issue that, that a lot of uh, us involved in water management are are looking at. The, uh, the story that I want to share with you uh, does concern uh, activities within our district and I want to uh, give you a, a bit of a layout in the event that you're unfamiliar uh, with this area but uh, the red boundary here is the district boundary for High Plains Underground Water Conservation District uh, created in 1951. Uh, we have all our parts of 16 counties and the northern part, as you can tell, is uh, kind of in the southwest uh, Amarillo area and then we go to south of Lubbock. And then on the west uh, from the state line with New Mexico over to uh, the Caprock Escarpment on the east. As far as the aquifer that uh, we'll be talking about principally, it is the Dockham Aquifer. And the district boundary again here is shown in this uh, kind of uh, greenish color. The, the extent of the Dockham Aquifer is shown as it extends not uh, only through Texas, but, but uh, into New Mexico and, and perhaps a, a little bit into the Oklahoma Panhandle. So in visiting with our staff and in compiling the material for this presentation, we, we talked about what makes um, communication effective and good, uh, meaningful. And largely the answer is, it is the person that's presenting the material. All of the supporting uh, visual information is important, but, but not as important as the person that is communicating. And so hopefully uh, during the uh, course of this presentation and sharing this information, uh, the point that, that I hope to be communicating is that uh, groundwater conservation districts uh, have the responsibility for managing aquifers. It's a very important responsibility and uh, we take it seriously and, and give an example of a few of the things that, that we are doing here uh, that, that other districts across the state uh, I know are also uh, engaged in these same activities. But again, uh, for our area, uh, we have three aquifers. Uh, we start with the Ogallala, it's the principal aquifer. In parts of the water district, we also have Edwards Trinity High Plains. 
And then the DACA aquifer does cover the entire extent of High Plains Water District. And of course, the arrow at the bottom notes that uh, we go deeper as we go from the Ogallala into those other aquifers. As far as a comparison of these, just to give you some uh, perspective, uh, we have included some of the facts and figures from some infographic sheets that we do share on our website about these aquifers, the depth of them, uh, and the range of that depth across the water district, and, and many others across the state, I'm sure, have a, a diverse uh, set of characteristics with aquifers. Uh, this is just a, an illustration here in our area, but uh, you can tell that the depth, the saturated thickness, uh, the range of well yield, those are all highly variable even within a single aquifer unit. So the overview of the content uh, moving forward is to talk some about groundwater management. Uh, the second part of it is uh, certainly important to the first, and that's understanding aquifers. And then lastly, the communication that is uh, so vital and important uh, with groundwater management, uh, with groundwater uh, research, uh, the associated data collection, it's all very important to communicate that. And then because conservation is certainly in our name, the efforts that we make in encouraging it, informing owners of the aquifer conditions so they can make conservation decisions uh, accordingly. Now, the story of groundwater management in uh, this area and across the state includes a variety of owners, explorers, uh, people that, that aren't sure what they have but are exploring it, and then managers. Uh, Texas Water Code Chapter 36, we're all familiar with this, but uh, it does emphasize that groundwater conservation districts are the state's preferred method of groundwater management. Uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and read the, the rest of that section because it does lend some additional information to, to what is groundwater management, but it isn't officially defined. So we talk about groundwater management. The word management occurs, uh, I think, over 150 times in Chapter 36 of the Texas Water Code, but what does it mean? This is an attempt to show the different components of management and how a particular uh, part of this uh, affects the other parts. So first and foremost, uh, been well established in Texas for, for a long, long time, but groundwater is a privately owned resource and that is the beginning of any part of a groundwater management discussion is that it is private property. We we'll move from that into monitoring the resource no matter where you are. This will be part of management, uh, conducting studies and research on this aquifer or the uh, different aquifers that may be a part of a district's uh, groundwater management responsibility, uh, ultimately developing rules, but then also communicating. I think another important part of this particular uh, graphic and, and a message that I hope uh, you can visualize is that uh, moving a particular part of any one of these uh, likewise will affect the other uh, gears as they move and turn. So that is a, uh, an important, I think, uh, illustration that, that I hope is communicated in this particular graphic. So in light of uh, this particular aquifer, the Dockham aquifer being the deepest aquifer in the water district. Uh, it does have areas that, that are uh, higher in uh, TDS and mineral content than others. Uh, we don't consider uh, this uh, necessarily a, a brackish uh, aquifer study. Uh, we have rules for all of the aquifers in the district and have for some time. It just so happens this particular aquifer uh, is the deepest. Uh, it's the one that is not quite as developed as the other aquifers are for sure. And there are areas in this aquifer where water quality is certainly a concern. But relating to the internal effort that has been conducted here, 
Uh, we have a monitoring network. The illustration that is shown right beneath that is just a screen grab from some of our annual water level observations. The middle part there is a, is a blue bar. Uh, this is part of the uh, staff research and data collection program that, that has intensified over the last five years or so. And then lastly, we do have uh, external partnerships and uh, some research partners that have also been very integral in us learning more about this resource. So as far as the monitoring and, and research topics, uh, I think they can generally be uh, categorized in, in these six areas that, that are shown here. Uh, certainly we have water level observations, both uh, from an annual program perspective, in addition to the installation of some continuous monitoring equipment. Uh, because water quality is uh, variable and uh, highly variable, uh, not only spatially, but within the aquifer itself, uh, it's also been a subject that has uh, taken a lot of our uh, time and, and effort. Uh, if you look at aquifers of Texas, you'll see in the Dockham aquifer, an area that, that covers quite a bit of our water district uh, with a line that uh, denotes an area that's expected to be greater than 5,000 milligrams per liter. But uh, is that indeed where that line occurs or is it uh, a little differently? And then pumping. There are some very productive areas of this aquifer. It has been used to uh, uh, supplement the uh, municipal water uh, source in, in several communities across the water district. Uh, but are there other areas that we don't know of yet that have enough productivity to either meet a need or, or supplement the existing source? A well inventory is, has been an interesting exercise also. Uh, we have some Dockham wells that have been in place since the 1960s. And so uh, we've had records of, of some of those in so far as the completion and all, but we've also found a number of different uh, records of construction for some wells that only partially uh, penetrate this aquifer. Now, whether or not that was due to just the curiosity of the landowner or some other issue is, is unknown, but we do have a number of wells that at least partially go into this aquifer. The literature review uh, process has also been uh, very informative. Uh, the Texas Water Development Board has a number of uh, reports and different studies over the years concerning this aquifer, uh, but the most recent uh, arguably has been uh, the High Plains Aquifer System Groundwater Availability Model uh, Report, uh, which contains a, a lot of uh, very useful information that we have uh, found to be uh, very helpful in, in answering questions that, that we have or maybe our landowners have. And then lastly, as part of our monitoring and research, we've, we've had to uh, stop periodically and say, what do we know and what do we, do? What do we not know? Uh, or do we truly know where our knowledge gaps uh, occur? As I mentioned in the uh, earlier uh, slides, uh, water quality is variable in this aquifer and not only spatially uh, like east to west or north to south, but, but within the aquifer itself. And so this is an illustration of that. We have uh, in our staff uh, field exercises, uh, logs of water quality, and this is one example. Uh, to the far left would be the very top of the water column. And then of course you go deeper uh, in the aquifer at this particular site as you go to the right uh, axis. And you see that that top section of water, if you will, uh, falls within a green category that's about three to 5,000 TDS, but there is a point as you go down into that water column where it quickly uh, goes to uh, greater than 10,000 TDS. And so vertically as well as uh, horizontally and, and spatially, uh, water quality does vary quite a bit uh, within this aquifer. Where have we spent money? So we have spent money in uh, four principal areas which are, sh which are shown here. Uh, test well partnerships, I'll, I'll touch on here in just a moment. Uh, those have been uh, very meaningful. I, I think we've actually uh, 
enjoyed them and we've had some fun with them because we, we've all enjoyed learning more about this and, and knowing uh, as you go into these greater depths uh, what is there. Uh, but that's been about 225,000 uh, to date. Uh, we've spent about 138,000 with external research partners, uh, 31,000 in monitoring equipment. A lot of that uh, is uh, water quality related. And uh, in order to get to greater depths, you have to have more robust equipment, uh, more cable, uh, all of that sort of thing. So a fair, uh, fairly large expense in monitoring equipment. And then uh, the geophysical logging uh, to date has been about 76,000, and that's with a partnership through the U.S. Geological Survey. So Dalkum by the numbers, this is a, a shorter summary of some data that we also have in another infographic, infographic on our website, but uh, we have uh, flow tested around 139 wells in the last five years. We've obtained uh, 23 detailed geophysical logs at separate well sites, and we have established 32 DACAM aquifer wells as uh, part of our annual water level observation program. Our external research topics have uh, addressed several different areas, and, and quite uh, honestly, uh, the way that they have been submitted uh, has, has fallen generally into these categories, which which are all uh, very germane uh, to decision making and understanding more about this aquifer. What about the economics? Uh, it is quite deep. Uh, it takes a lot more money to, to complete a well uh, because there is uh, some higher TDS water. Typically the uh, well is drilled through the Ogallala formation. The surface casing is set and the annular cement is then installed so that the driller can then go on down into the Dockham formation. But can it be used economically and, and for what reasons? Uh, where is this aquifer suitable? Uh, and, and is it suitable as is for different types of use? Uh, are there some users that might be able to use it without any treatment at all? Uh, are there any impacts to the overlying aquifers? And then water treatment, uh, a fast evolving area in water resource management and development where we see higher concentrations of dissolved minerals. How can those be uh, removed economically and, and where might the, the greatest gains be uh, obtained in some of that new technology? Some of our external research partners are shown here. Uh, universities like uh, Texas Tech and the Department of Civil uh, Engineering, uh, Agricultural and Applied Economics, uh, Tarleton State University, Texas A&M AgriLife, Research, uh, as well as the U.S. Geological Survey have all been very important in uh, addressing these various subjects. This particular photo is one that uh, our staff and I uh, really uh, appreciate. Uh, this is actually from one of our test well projects with the city of Lubbock. Uh, it was taken here, as you can see, so the wide open spaces, uh, the clouds, uh, the drilling rig is there on site, which is the beginning uh, and introduction of the uh, next subject, which is to know more about this aquifer and others. Ultimately, you can do all of the analytics. You can uh, do surface geophysics. You can do a lot of different things, but ultimately you have to make a hole in the ground and see what's there. And so as we uh, move into that subject matter, a nice photo of one of our test wells uh, being drilled through one of our uh, partners uh, and a shorter uh, geophysical log from that particular site. Uh, this, uh, or all of our test wells, I think have been over uh, 1400 feet deep. Uh, you can't really show with any amount of uh, readability a log that reaches 1400 feet in this type of format. So I've kind of screen captured this to a depth of only several hundred feet, but it's an illustration of the wealth of information that you may obtain from a geophysical log. With our test well partnerships, we have some diversity. Uh, we have uh, some municipalities and those differ in size and population. Uh, our most recent uh, partner was actually an agricultural user uh, with a dairy, that's United Ag. 
And then again, back to uh, these three municipalities, Lubbock, uh, Abernathy, and Wolferth, uh, different size communities. Uh, Lubbock certainly is the largest. Uh, the other two are smaller, but it uh, goes to show that no matter the size of the operation or the municipality, there is interest in uh, alternative water supplies. Wrapping up this uh, content, I want to talk about communication. It was mentioned uh, towards the beginning of this presentation, and it's mentioned here not as an afterthought uh, toward the end of the presentation, but I think rather to emphasize the importance of this. It is vital to share with the people that own the water and others uh, what you're learning and what you know and don't know. And we've attempted to do that through various platforms and I've listed four of them here. Uh, we have made some uh, short informational videos, uh, largely I believe shared via social media, but we do have a YouTube uh, channel and uh, that compilation of information is available. Infographics tend to be another usable form of communication. Uh, we gather so much and we look at it uh, quite a bit, but uh, we might also tend to present information in a manner that the average uh, consumer is either unable to uh, interpret or just have difficulties with a lot of information. And so we try to summarize some of that in these infographics and videos that are a little more consumable. Informational meetings, uh, of course, board meetings or open meetings to the public. They're a great inf uh, informational platform for uh, informing your board of directors, but also informational meetings can be of the form where you invite yourself. Uh, you call a municipality, you call a group of uh, others that may be uh, uh, interested and you ask them, can we come and share this information with you? Uh, it might also be that you uh, talk to uh, people in other parts of the state. Uh, we've, we've gone to uh, different meetings in Austin. Uh, we've gone to other organizational meetings and been able to share this information. And then the last of these communication tools uh, is actually, I, I believe, the newest, and that is an interactive map. And it allows people to consume this information from any platform at any time, uh, sitting on the couch on the weekend, uh, whenever it may be. Now this is a short uh, illustration or just a brief illustration of this particular interactive feature. Uh, it can be used on a PC. Uh, you can look it up on your uh, phone. But again, it provides uh, access to this information and uh, it doesn't require a person to come to our office, uh, which is especially meaningful, I think, throughout this spring and some of the limitations that have been present. But uh, it allows people to look this up. We can get on the phone with them or wherever uh, they are, uh, FaceTime, uh, another video platform, and, and walk them through some of the features of this so that they can consume this data, which is what we want and it's a very important part of this outreach and communication. I want to just wrap up and say that uh, very thankful for all of the folks who have uh, helped with this effort. Uh, that's the well owners uh, here in the water district uh, providing access to the wells and, and working with us and exchanging information. Uh, also our board because we have uh, used a lot of money and resources uh, uh, to compile this information and to obtain it. Certainly our field staff members who are engaged in, in this activity uh, regularly. And uh, a lot of this is uh, pretty labor intensive. Uh, the, these deeper aquifers and the amount of uh, manpower, you might say that it takes to uh, conduct uh, sampling of them is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty labor intensive. And then moving on, uh, of course, all of the folks in our office in communication, GIS and IT, that have provided uh, uh, a lot of support in making the information more consumable for, for all of us uh, 
in the office as well as uh, our, our uh, landowners. And then also our research partners on our external side that have provided a lot of help in thinking of different uh, ways of uh, analyzing uh, certain uh, topics uh, that will ultimately benefit uh, the people that are here. And with that, I, I want to say thanks, uh, but also want to just say, and in wrapping up the topic of groundwater management, uh, I think a good question for us to always ask is, are we providing a value and are we providing good information to, uh, to the people that own the, the water within each of our districts? Uh, if we're not providing some value and information to them, uh, then we've got to figure out how to, uh, because uh, those are the people that we're serving. And, and I hope that the information and the, the data that we have is useful uh, as they make conservation decisions uh, and others. So I appreciate it. And I will uh, conclude at that point, Zach. Fantastic, sir. Really, really appreciate uh, you laying that out and, and also taking the perspective from the management of, of what's spurned and, and taken y'all and the, uh, you know, added uh, partnerships that y'all have gained and, and emphasized throughout the this whole study for y'all. Uh, one clarification question that, that I did have was was in relation, again, typically anytime anybody thinks of, of the greater High Plains region, they only think of the Ogallala. And you mentioned some of the geophysical laws in the 1400 foot range but uh, could you just kind of give us a general uh, depth of what generally where the Ogallala is versus where the Dockham is that you're studying? Yeah sure so uh, of course the Ogallala formation is, is the uh, youngest formation so it's closest to the land surface and I think some of our deepest Ogallala wells uh, only go to a depth of a little over 500 feet below land surface and uh, the Dockham, of course, is uh, present across all of the water district and in the areas where it's deepest, uh, it's somewhere close to 2,000 feet below the land surface to the penetrate the full thickness of that aquifer unit. And so there is uh, around 4x uh, difference there, uh, 500 feet to 2,000, four times the depth that, that may be required to uh, get through that whole aquifer unit at certain parts of the water district. Awesome, sir. Again, if anybody else has any questions, I don't see any directly right now, but we'll certainly pass those on to Jason and greatly appreciate the presentation, your time and effort, sir. Thank you.